Home Guard Manual 1941. I'm going to do some videos about some of the stuff in this um, book. It's all manner of different things in here. I'll do a bit of reading as well. It was May 1940 and Hitler stood on the cliffs at Calais and eyed up his next conquest, England. There was a call to arms that saw the founding of the Home Guard, a motley collection of men, poorly armed, many too old to fight in the war. <coughs> the Home Guard was untried in war, often without weapons or training, and they were Britain's last ditch defence against the Germans. But all was not lost, and over a period of a few months, this ragtag group was armed, uniformed, and trained using the Home Guard manual. Taught basic field craft, how to survive in the open, how to destroy tanks, ambush the invaders, use weapons of varying sorts, make booby traps, read maps, and send signals. The fledgling volunteer was turned into a veritable fighting machine, or was he just another member of Dad's army? <coughs> it all started in 1933 when Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. From that day our war was inevitable. As Hitler slowly nibbled away at Europe, annexing country after country, the rest of the world stood and watched, neither helping the invaded countries nor stopping the aggressive German expansion into Central Europe. The 1938 Munich Agreement only delayed the inevitable, the invasion of Poland. However, <coughs> was the final straw for the Allies. Both British and French governments had signed non-aggressive pacts with Poland and both were duty bound to declare war against any aggressor. When Germany invaded Poland under the pretext of border incursions by the Poles, Britain and France stood side by side with Poland. Both declared war on Germany and her allies. But by the 6th of October, thanks mainly to a Russian invasion of eastern Poland, war in the east was over. Poland was overrun and eastern Europe was split into German and Russian spheres of influence. <coughs> and so began a period known as the phony war. The Germans and the French faced each other with Britain's expeditionary force supporting the French. Along with the Maginot Line, there were numerous small skirmishes and the RAF dropped propaganda leaflets onto German cities, but there was little evidence of war. For the winter of 1939-1940 it was all quiet in Europe and the war raged at sea instead. It was all to change in April 1940 with the invasion of Norway and Denmark by Germany and the landing of an Allied force at Narvik in an attempt to prevent the traffic of Swedish iron ore to Germany. On the 10th of May the invasion of France, Belgium, <coughs> the Netherlands and Luxembourg started. The phony war had ended and the German blitzkrieg was about to overwhelm Europe. Winston Churchill became Prime Minister that day too. By the 11th Luxembourg had capitulated, the Netherlands and Belgium would soon to follow. By the end of May things were hotting up and it was realised by the British government that the position in Norway was untenable. Despite recapturing Narvik from the Nazis it was obvious that the troops were needed elsewhere and they were evacuated. Our story begins on Tuesday the 14th of May 1940 with a short broadcast made on BBC Radio. Directly after 9pm news the formation of the largest civilian army ever seen in Britain was announced. Anthony Eden in his new role as War Minister spoke to the nation. <coughs> I want to speak to you tonight about the form of warfare which the Germans have been employing so extensively against Holland and Belgium, namely the dropping of parachute troops behind the main defensive lines, in order to leave nothing to chance and to supplement from sources as yet untapped the means of defence already arranged. We are going to ask you to help us in a manner which I know will be welcome to thousands of you. Since the war began the government has received countless inquiries from all over the kingdom from men of all ages who are for one reason or another not engaged in military service and who wish to do something for the defence of their country. And now is your opportunity. We want large numbers of such men in Great Britain who are British subjects between the ages of 17 and 65 to come forward and offer their services. The name of the new force which is now to be raised will be the Local Defence Volunteers. The name describes in its duties <coughs> three words. This is a part-time job, so there will be no need for any volunteer to abandon his present occupation. When on duty, you will form part of the armed forces. You will not be paid, but you will receive a uniform and will be armed. Eden finished by informing anyone who was interested that in order to volunteer, 
what you have to do is give in your name to the local police station and then as and when we want you we will let you know even before the announcement was over men were leaving their houses and making their way to the local police station to sign up the expeditionary force was being pushed back through France and it was obvious that the British Isles were, to, were next to be invaded Churchill had already realised that the country's forces were committed elsewhere and that the defence of Britain itself depended on the men left behind it was those first few weeks of the local defence volunteers <coughs> that were portrayed so comically in Dad's army, with no weapons, no uniforms and no training. The LDV was perhaps worthy of the jokes and the image that had been portrayed of it for the best part of 70 years. But within a few short months, the LDV had metamorphosed into a highly trained fighting force. It was expected that the LDV would be composed of eventually about 175,000 men. But a quarter of a million signed up in the first 24 hours alone. By the end of June, with the fall of France, a mere two weeks before, Britain stood alone, and one and a half million volunteers swelled the ranks of the old DV, a force that now equaled in size that of the regular army. While many of the men were ex-soldiers, most were totally untrained, and a whole raft of books were published to help them with the army skills they would have to learn. Everything from drill to tank killing, from patrolling to signalling, from making booby traps to ambushing the army. This one, actually published for the New Zealand Home Guard, is based on the scores of books and pamphlets published by the British War Office for the Home Guard, as the LDV became known in July 1940.